Hello everyone, this is me, Big T, and we're doing another fanfiction reading. This will be from the Harry Potter fandom, and this is from Beware0313. This is called The Marauder's Mischievous Midnight, and just to clear up any possible confusion, I'm just schmucky duck reading it. Beware is the one that wrote it. Me schmucky, beware righty. Okay, good. So, this is... The Marauder's Mischievous Midnight. Minerva McGonagall couldn't sleep. She tried, mind you, but night after night she found herself staring at the ceiling of her chambers. Counting jumping measles, reciting goblin rebellions from the 18th century, listing the twelve common uses of dragon blood in reverse order. Nothing worked. As soon as she began to doze, she saw their faces and they haunted her the dead faces of her former students. Minerva had never had any children of her own. She had always wanted them, but there simply never seemed to be a good time. When she and her husband had first married, they had careers to navigate. Children, they reasoned, could always come in a few years. Unfortunately, her dream for children vanished with her husband's early death. As a result, her children were her charges that reside in the Gryffindor dormitory. At the tender age of eleven, they entered her care. They were so young, so impressionable, and so carefree. It broke Minerva's heart to think about the world that was waiting for them outside of these secure walls when they left her at the mere age of seventeen. The fact was that the wizarding world was at war. Lord Voldemort's persecution knew no bounds. Many witches and wizards tried to stay neutral if there was such a thing. But Minerva knew just how many of her former students were involved in the fray. It broke her heart to know that her children faced such horrors daily. It was to Minerva's ultimate despair that earlier that day she had received notice of the latest casualties of the war. The Pruitt twins. Fabian and Gideon Pruitt had been some of her favorite students. Oh, they had been troublesome pranksters, all right. They had been the mentors for Sirius Black and James Potter, leading to the construction of the Marauders still gave Minerva boundless troubles, but they had been kind, funny, intelligent, and compassionate. It was their faces, amongst many others, that Minerva saw night after night when she attempted to lay her head to rest. It was their faces that kept her awake at night. This night in particular, Minerva had already taken a stroll around the lake, the courtyard, and the east wing. She could not escape their faces, and she could not find any rest in her solace. She entered the West Wing, however. Minerva was astonished to hear whooping voices coming from the adjacent corridor. Depulso! cried a voice. Depulso! cried another. What on earth? Minerva queried to herself. Suddenly, two four-poster beds rapidly flew around the corner, hurtling towards her at a terrifying pace. Minerva screamed and dove for the ground as the beds went directly over her, sweeping the witch's hat straight off of her head. Minerva jumped to her feet with her wand in her hand right as the two beds fell out of the air, causing a horrible screeching sound as the wooden leg slid across the corridor floor. Grinning like Cheshire cats, James Potter and Sirius Black high-fived each other on the four-poster bed they were both sitting on. Whoop yours, ten sickles, boys! Sirius Black cheered, sending red celebratory sparks out of his wand. Peter Pettigrew and Remus Lupin glared at Sirius and James for their own four-poster. This is bollocks, Remus complained. Wormtail can't steer a levitation charm to save his life. James reached into the air to catch the money being tossed. Shouldn't have taken that bet then, Mooney. We had you beat by half a Quidditch pitch, he mocked. What? Peter screamed. That was no more than ten feet, you blind tosser. Lumos. It's amazing how a single spell, that wasn't a silencing spell, mind you, could cause such silence. Well, for a solid moment, at least. This was the Marauders, after all. Professor Minnie! Sirius screamed. What on earth are you doing out so late on a night such as this? Yeah, Professor, James added. Isn't tomorrow night your evening for patrol? Minerva rubbed the bridge of her nose, leaving it to the Marauders to memorize and plan around her patrol schedule. You boys had better have an extremely good explanation for this. Minerva said in a low, threatening voice, I have a mind to drag the four of you to Professor Dumbledore's office this instant. A sixth voice sounded from behind Minerva, making her jump. 
No need, my dear Minerva. I'm already awake. Professor Dumbledore strode into the light cast from Minerva's wand, straightening the spectacles on the bridge of his nose. James and Sirius continued to grin while poor Peter and Remus looked utterly terrified to see their headmaster. I must admit, however, I am the most definitely interested in an explanation as well. Perhaps your boys could step down from these beds while we discuss what in Merlin's name you are doing out of bed at this hour. James sat up straight, slightly straighter and cleared his throat. <clears throat> you see, Professor, we can't actually get out of the beds. That would be breaking school rules. Minerva's eyebrows jumped to her hairline. Mr. Potter, what in Merlin's name are you on about? Rest assured, you've already broken enough school rules tonight to warrant. Minerva bristled as Professor Dumbledore raised a hand to silence her. Please, Minerva. The old man said softly, very well then, boys. I would like to hear your explanation. Well, you see, Albus. May I call you Albus? Sirius began. Professor will do, Mr. Black. Thank you, however, for your consideration. Dumbledore said sternly, his eyes twinkling. Right you are, Professor. Anyways, as I'm sure you know, Professor Flitwick covered banishing charms today in class. Of course, that is standard fourth-year curriculum. Professor Dumbledore nodded sagely. Well, he assigned us to practice the banishing charm tonight for homework, Remus continued. Unfortunately, there wasn't ample room to practice in our dormitory. Textbooks kept flying and James nearly broke a window. James glared and shushed his friend. Sirius hurriedly piped in. Um, never mind the window, though, Professor. I can assure you that our dormitory is in pristine condition. For going the beds that are currently among present company. Will you please get to the point? Minerva said sharply. Of course, Professor. Anyways, we tried to practice in the common room, but the seven years were getting extremely frustrated with us and threatened to kick us out, Remus continued. So, being the model students that we are, we simply had to find a way to practice. It wouldn't do for students of our caliber to not be prepared to demonstrate our charm casting ability for Professor Flitwick next lesson, James explained. Fortunately, with Remus being an aspiring prefect and all, Merlin knows why. Sirius muttered just loudly enough for everyone to hear. Remus has a copy of the standard and exhaustingly long book of rules, regulations, and expectations for the behavior of Hogwarts students on hand, James finished. You see, Professor, we were examining the rule book and we discovered something. The book never explicitly says that students have to remain in the common room and dormitories at night, Remus concluded. It doesn't? Dumbledore queried doubtfully, do you happen to have the book on hand? Sure, Professor. Sirius said, pulling the book in question out from beneath a pillow. Sirius handed the book to Professor Dumbledore. You're going to want to take a look at page 634, section 7, article 7. Dumbledore deftly opened to the proper page and read aloud, a strict curfew of 8.30 p.m. is set for all students below 5th year, while a curfew of 9.30 p.m. will exist for students studying at the new level. After curfew, students are forbidden to set foot outside of the common rooms and are to remain either in the common room or in their beds. Professor Dumbledore looked up from the rulebook and raised his eyebrow at the four boys sitting atop the four poster beds. So you see, Professor, James piped up, we found our solution. So as long as we were in our beds, we could leave the sanctity of our beloved common room without breaking any school rules. So we levitated our beds out to the seventh floor corridor and began practicing our banishing charms. Unfortunately, we were absolutely surprised to examine the results of a vanishing charm that missed its mark and instead hit an object that wasn't banishable, Sirius continued. Like a stone wall, Mr. Black, Professor Dumbledore prompted. Exactly, Professor. You see, we were shocked that our banishing charms were actually causing our floating beds to repel themselves. And why, may I ask, were you continuing to levitate your beds once outside of the common room, Minerva asked. Peter looked at the bed sitting upon the floor and nervously piped up. Well, the beds have legs, don't they? The rules state the students are forbidden to set foot outside of the common rooms after curfew. We weren't sure if the feet of the beds touching the floors counted. Let me see if I understand this, boys. Professor Dumbledore began. You discovered a loophole in the rulebook, allowing you to levitate your beds out into the corridor, and then as a result of practicing banishing charms, you tested a hypothesis about banishing charms on constructed objects which sent your beds careening down the hallways. That is indeed an apt description of our explanation, Professor, James smiled. 
Professor Dumbledore again glanced at the roll book, stoking his long white beard. I'm afraid you boys overlook something, however. He said slowly, the rule states that students are to remain in the common room or in their beds. I see four of you, but only two beds. That means that two of you are out of the common room, but not in your own bed. James and Sirius paled. May I take it then, gentlemen, that those two beds belong to Mr. Lupin and Mr. Pettigrew? All four boys nodded. In that case, Mr. Potter and Mr. Black, I'm afraid that I'm going to have to take five points each from Gryffindor for breaking school rules. Minerva's jaw dropped. Professor Dumbledore, that can't be all. What about... Minerva exclaimed before Professor Dumbledore again raised a hand to silence her. My dear Professor, of course that isn't all. The boys showed that they have some real initiative. Can you imagine reading this entire rule book? Also, as a result, they brought to my attention a logical fallacy in our esteemed rule book. I think that deserves ten points each. Does it not? Minerva stared at him incredulously. In addition to that... They also performed experimentations with a spell they had just learned. I greatly admire that kind of out-of-the-box thinking. Too many times do we get encumbered by the generic learning process here at Hogwarts. Take another five points each for your experimentation, gentlemen. Marauders looked like Christmas had come early. Now, with that being said, first thing in the morning, I'll be updating the rulebook to make levitating your beds out of the dormitories a punishable offense. Please don't attempt to do that again, boys, or you will find yourself in rather serious trouble. Alas, it is getting later by the minute. Might I recommend that you gentlemen levitate your beds right back up to where they belong and get to sleep? Certainly, Professor Wingardium Leviosa, Sirius proclaimed, flicking his wand. The bed lifted off of the ground, and James lifted his wand and pointed it at the wall in front of him. Dip, James trailed off. After a moment, Professor Dumbledore flicked his wand and canceled the impromptu silencing spell. Might I recommend, gentlemen, that you rather walk and levitate your beds back to the dormitory? James blushed. Uh, sure thing, Professor. Good night. Good night, boys. Sleep well. Albus muttered softly as the four lads walked down the hall towards the Gryffindor common room, beds floating ahead. Once the boys rounded the corner, Minerva crossed her arms and turned to Albus. Albus, what on earth are you thinking? Those boys were careening through here so rapidly they may as well have been on brooms. Albus bent down and picked up Minerva's hat. Just imagine if they had crashed into a wall or hit another wandering student. Someone could have been seriously hurt tonight by their antics. Merlin knows they almost ran me over, Minerva ranted. Albus sighed and further examined the hat in his hands. Have you heard about the Pruitt twins yet, Minerva? Albus muttered softly. Minerva immediately softened. Of course I did, Albus. That's why I've been wandering the halls tonight. Every time I close my eyes to sleep, I see their faces. I see their faces and the faces of everyone else I know who's been killed in this bloody war. I can't sleep, Albus. Albus nodded understandingly. Sometimes I wonder if I should allow these young witches and wizards entrance into the Order. I can't bear when a former student of mine so full of life, so full of energy, falls victim to this war. Albus, Minerva paused. As much as I can't bear it either, I admire their courage. They want to improve this world for the better, just like we do. Don't they deserve that right? Albus sighed and allowed a small smile. Indeed, Minerva. That is always my conclusion whenever my thoughts turn down that dark path. They have every right. I look at those four boys tonight, the marauders they call themselves. They're intelligent, cunning, talented, and brave. Where do you think they'll be in three years' time when they finish here at Hogwarts? Do you think they'll stand by the wayside and let others try to fix the world's problems? Minerva didn't answer. She instead turned to look out the window, looking at the moonlight reflecting off of the lake. I fear they will have a rough time of it when it comes. The war isn't slowing down, Minerva. It's only ramping up. This war is far from over, and I worry that those innocent boys will have a part to play in this story yet. Yes, they were indeed reckless tonight, Minerva. They could have gotten hurt or injured another. However, I don't believe anyone is in need of Madame Pomfrey's assistance tonight. I simply can't bear to take the light out of their eyes. The world will do that long well before I ever will. A couple of tears escaped Minerva's eyes as she turned her back completely to her longtime mentor. Albus placed a single comforting hand on her shoulder. Good night, Minerva. He said before turning to walk down the hall. Good night, Albus. Next morning, Lily Evans sat down for breakfast in the Great Hall next to her friend, Marlene McKinnon. 
Good morning, Marlene. Did you see those idiot marauders floating their beds out of the portrait hole last night? Absolutely ridiculous, aren't they? Lily ranted. Marlene laughed. Ridiculous? It was bloody brilliant, she exclaimed. In all of Hogwarts history, I don't think anyone's ever levitated their beds into the corridor before. Lily huffed. Well, I, for one, don't think it was bloody brilliant. Think of the trouble they could have gotten in. I wonder if they managed to lose more points for Gryffindor. Marlene frowned. You know, Lily, as much as you complain about those boys, sometimes I wonder if you're not just smitten with them. Besides, Gryffindor has 50 more points this morning than we did last night. I don't think they got in any trouble. Don't be ridiculous. Of course I'm not smitten with any of those big-headed tossers. I just want Gryffindor to... Lily trailed off as she glanced at the hourglasses. How in Godric's name had they earned 50 points overnight? Lily glanced down the table towards where the marauders were dining and accidentally caught James' eye. All right there, Evans! James called loudly from down the table. Fancy going to Hogsmeade with me next weekend? Lily huffed and blushed slightly. Has the giant squid learned to skateboard yet, Potter? She snarled back across the table. James shrugged and turned his attention back to his pumpkin juice. What's a skateboard, Prongs? Not a clue, Padfoot. Not a clue. Suddenly, Professor Dumbledore rose and asked for the school's attention. Good morning, Hogwarts students. Before you go scurrying off to your morning engagements, I have a quick announcement to make. As of this morning, it is now against school rules to levitate any of your bedroom furniture outside of your dormitories. Thank you for all your attention to this brief public service announcement, and I hope you all have a fantastic day. The Hufflepuffs and Ravenclaws glanced at each other curiously. The Gryffindors exploded with laughter, and that evening, many Slytherin parents received letters from their children depicting yet another instance of their headmaster's lunacy. And that was The Marauder's Mischievous Midnight by Beware 0313. Sorry about that. Anyway, like I said before, I'm Schmucky Duck reading it. If you like this kind of story, if you if you enjoyed it, you know what? Give the author some love. The, if you don't tell them, they don't know. I used to write this stuff. Give them some reviews. Let them know, hey, you're. I'm enjoying this. I'm glad you liked this. I had a couple things that could have been better, could have been worse. Give them that info. If you have any comments, you can also leave them down below for me saying, hey, you read it like, you know, schmuck tea or, you know, you did well or something else. Ah, my voice is going out. Anyway, give link down below. Give the author some love. I'm Big T Anderson. Thank you for joining us today. Have a good one. Ta-ta.